Cricket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. The Rugby Podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously. Welcome to the Rackets with myself, Nick Easter, and uh, my co-host, Kieran Bracken. Uh, Still in lockdown, as you can see, and we're here to discuss all things rugby. What we've got on the show today, we're going to, with that brilliant uh, sports documentary The Last Dance featuring the really starring Michael Jordan we're going to sort of uh, discuss that and you know how that sort of is reflective in our own careers in terms of the personalities and we'll be discussing uh, the Augustine Pichot claims of why he didn't win the vote to become chairman of World Rugby Um, before that though Brex anything interesting been going on in your week? Oh, it's the same old lockdown, isn't it? I think the advantage for me is I've got three three boys, 16-year-olds, 14-year-old, 11-year-olds. So, um, every, you know, working out innovative things to do. But one thing I have been doing, I don't know whether you've seen it on, on YouTube, but I've got my own, um, it's called Skills Guru. Uh, so basically, I thought having coached... No, is, that over, is that a plug? Is that a plug? Yeah, all right. That's that's just uh, that's just a, a shameless, why not? shameless. So, so basically, what I thought was, I, I've coached uh, England scrum halves uh, over the years, many scrum halves: Ben Young, Joe Simpson, Danny Kerr. Um, so we'll, we'll blame you for that, then, shall we? Yeah, yeah. People like <laughs> Moses Rawa, Louis, um, you know, Welsh scrum halves, lo- loads of players, and yeah. um, and I never, um, I never really, you know, sort of had a chance to. I suppose, pass on some knowledge to the, the general public. And um, I've done one-on-one coaching for people. I thought, Do you know what would be a good idea? Why don't I get some videos down uh, and drills and, and instruction videos on YouTube? So I started doing that and uh, I had quite a lot of fun with it. So by the end of it, it'll be about 45 minute an hour sort of masterclass with a few challenges in there. And then, um, you know, I'm going to, you know, hopefully people might sort of be bored and think, and obviously it's not, it's not necessarily for your front row forwards or your pack who want to be scrum halves. It's basically set, you know, focusing on the scrum half skill. And I've quite enjoyed that. Uh, I mean, later on, in the, you know, today we'll be spoke, speaking to Joe Simpson. I actually coached Joe uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, I, I just kind of, I just see what he thinks, but I think the, the role of the scrum half has changed uh, over the years. You know, in my day, it was all about having the fastest pass. That was it. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I look now, you've got these wingers coming in and we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat with Joe, what he thinks about mm-hmm. whether the artistry of, of, a, of being a scrum half has gone. But I think the role has changed as a scrum half. And I have told my young boys, you know, it's, it's not just about the passing like it perhaps was when I started out. It's much more of, about running a game and, and being a game changer, you know, like Faf de Klerk, those those sort of things. But I mean, I think I think um, in lockdown week, you know, every day... I mean, that... Has that really changed that much? Um, you know, they, they argue the greatest scrum half of all, Gareth Edwards. Yeah, he, he was the sort of um, he was the brains and the energy of, of the great Welsh and Lions teams of the seventies. And yeah, you know, he, he he was what you know mainly driving a game along with Barry John or Phil Bennett, whoever it may be. And of yeah. course, you know, one of the great England scrum halves, Matt Dawson, was very much the same, wasn't it? <laughs> of course it was listen um yeah i think i think there was i think they 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 um they sent out i don't know whether you were asked for the you know a, a, a vote on the greatest ever player um and i think austin healy and matt dawson were the only players to vote for themselves but uh but yeah um so gareth edwards was voted as and, and it'd be interesting you know the correlation between what we've been watching on the last dance watching um, watching him talk, uh, Michael talk about you know, about his journey, and and I can see Gareth Edwards being the same sort of inspiration. He was clearly, you know, better than any other scrum half in the world, and 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 to say he's be- better or much better than the players around him in Wales would be something. I'm not sure that was the case, but he was certainly a leader. Um, what a great player he was. You you know, every now and again in a generation, you get players like him, but. Um, but yeah, he he was he was amazing. But Matt Dawson being the greatest scrum half, I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure on that one. But 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 interestingly, this week you know we're, you know there's a lot of talk about uh, about the salary cap and about the wage cut for the players. I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to be a player at the moment with with the future uh, the way it's looking. Certainly taking a 25 percent pay cut. I think though there was there is a um, I guess some is a power struggle at the moment now with. With, with a team like Bristol, who actually remind me of the old Saracens when I joined in 97, 
who would sign who they want. They would want the salary cap to be as high as possible <clears throat> because they want to build a brand and they want to be the best. And it's interesting now watching Bristol go through the same uh, sort of like path. They're saying no to a reduction in the salary cap. They're saying no to... Um, well, I mean, that, that being players. changed, is it? It's always the ones with the deepest pockets that want yeah. to abolish it because they want to be the sort of bully boys with their uh, with their wallets and uh, win things on the back of it. Uh, it's not it's, easy, though. It's not it's, easy. It's not easy, is it? I mean, if you look at... OK, so what you look at the pros and cons of the salary cap. Um, I mean, not, not having a salary cap, but the salary cap as the amount at the moment is... You know, the negatives and what Bristol are saying, Steve Lansdowne, you know, the owner's sort of saying, and he's right, is you're going to lose the top talent from around the yeah. world. You now, are you going to be able to to get them in, which, you know, has a massive, massive commercial marketing and merchandising impact? Of course it does. But also, mm. it has a massive impact on, on the young players and the current players that you've actually got in your squad and bringing new ideas, um, new ways, uh, you know, you might have to adjust that your sort of game plan to suit your, your better players. You know, for example, they're going to have Red Rada and Charles Piertow in there. And, uh, yeah. You're not going to be playing 10-man rugby, are you, with those two? <laughs> um, and and the Premiership is a great product. You know, before all this happened, it was a wonderful product. Very, very competitive league. Um, you know, the intensity, the consistency of the intensity every single week meant it was very, very hard to call a winner. Um, yes, probably too many games, ultimately, you know, with everything else thrown in there. Um, but... You know, we want the game to survive. What we don't want to do is have any clubs going under. And look, not everyone is as financially as well off as Bristol and able to still pay their players, um, you know, full whack salary. And, uh, you know, I think mm. all but, again, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but from what I understand, maybe Exeter and Bristol are the only two that haven't furloughed their, their staff and players. Um, mm. So, you know, the sort of the majority of clubs are financially on a shoestring at the moment and sort of grasping at thin air that um, somehow rugby gets back on TV, even though it's behind closed doors, and they can uh, get the TV money. Um, you know, to yeah. Operate. Well, I think, I think rugby is in a different boat to quite a lot of other sports because um, I think they do rely... I mean, I don't think the TV money is enough to keep them alive or sustain for that long. Um, and that's why, to some extent, assuming that the, there aren't mass gatherings, that, that rugby will struggle to some extent, which may mean that there'll be further pay cuts uh, for the players. But again, it's a difficult one. Um, you know, when I when I joined Saracens, you know, I was sold this vision by Nigel Ray. He said, we're going to sign him, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And it was very exciting. And and in a way, um, you know, I, I actually feel for, for Bristol starts in a way, you know, they were set the parameters. There's a wage cap uh, that, that, that they were set. They took a long time to come up and they're building, I think, a fantastic, let's call it a franchise in Bristol. You know, they signed some amazing pro players. I mean, how they're going to keep all of these players sort of in one camp, uh, you know, over the next few years will be something to be seen. But... I'd be very excited if I was part of that squad and I'd be looking forward to, you know, to be perhaps lifting some silverware. I think when it comes to sustainability, you know, the question is, you know, if Lansdowne wasn't there or something happened, you know, that's the problem when you have, let's call it a sugar daddy who's investing in the future, spending a lot of money. And then a lot of the other clubs don't have that. It becomes... The, it becomes sort of us and them. It becomes, you know, teams at the top who were just going to race away with it. And But but Bristol deserve the opportunity to build this this great, great uh, product that they have. And so I do have, I, I do sort of like feel for them in a way. And I think the fact that the rest of the clubs are struggling, it, it's, it's then hard to sort of rationalise it all when you've got uh, ambition like they have. So it's, it's not an easy one, but I can imagine... You've got Bath and maybe Exeter who've got a better business model than some of the other clubs. And they're going to say, well, it's tough for the top, isn't it? That's, that's tough, tough lines, everyone. The fact, you know, the, the fact is that some of the teams have a veto to, to stop reducing the salary cap. But I'm interested on the, what you think as a player when it comes to the... And I do think the marquee players has um, sort of, unfortunately risen the, the the salaries of a lot of the let's call them average internationals so i wonder whether that would be something that they should look at because it, how would you feel 
um, at your club if had a massive signing? Or did you ever feel when you were at Quinns, when you're on your salary, pretty good salary, I guess, one of the senior players, but when, when Quinns would sign a really big player on massive money and you knew they were on massive money, did it make you and your agent think, do you know what, next time, I'm going to ask for an extra 100k or an extra 200k. Did that did that come up for you? No, uh, mate. It, I was look. You can get greedy with that. I remember when I was when I was playing for Oral, and uh, we had we had a sort of cross pollination um, arrangement, probably for the salary cap reasons for Wigan Rugby yeah. League. Yeah, all right. Um, I think Wigan used Oral, uh, arguably, to sort of get round things, maybe. <clears throat> um, and I remember Gary Connolly came over to us, and he had, oh, actually, wow, yeah. like, he, he had actually finished his rugby league, and he came over to us for a, for a season. The top top bloke, um, but I remember him him saying, uh, you know, sort of he was asked a question, you know, from some of the players. Oh, you know, do you, you know, you've been a legend rugby league player, but you're never the highest paid, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, do, do you bitter about that? Yes, look, I was always happy with what I arranged or my agent arranged as a, a as my salary and that's it otherwise you can become bitter you know you see this in football all the time don't you and you, you know you get these egos that grow and grow and grow and goes I've got to, you know no one can be paid more than me sort of contractually that, that's how they negotiate and it's not the right way mate and as far as I was concerned um every single contract I negotiated at, or my agent negotiated at Quinn's was an increase um, whenever yeah. it, that was actually an increase, even when I was into my sort of mid thirties, um, you know, they gave me what I thought my value was to the team, and there was never really any problems. There was, you know, there's a few, uh, what do you call it, when you're calling each other's bluff. Um, and I, you know, I had a couple of couple of offers from France at various times in my career, which I think, you know, I think back and I think, you know, could I have you know, maybe, you know, explored a sort of different environment, a different a different part of the world. But look, that's, that, that's gone now. Um, but my point is, they, they never took the piss. They knew my true, yeah. value, true value. They wanted to look after me. And, you know, I was never the highest paid player, but I was, I was happy with what I was getting. So there was never any sort of resentment or, or jealousy mm. from my end. Um, and, I, and to be honest with Quinns, they never, they never paid silly, silly money, as you see now. No, like some no of the they don't. Pay. I... Mm. Listen, I don't know the figures, but I very much doubt that anyone's ever been paid over four fifty there, or right. you know, maybe in recent years there might have been a couple in the four hundreds. I'm purely speculating, mate. I really don't know. Right. But, um, and Nick well, Evans, yeah. Nick Evans was our marquee player for a long, long time, and you know what, he was worth it. You know, yeah. and you don't begrudge him. The guy was, you know, not only an outstanding player and brilliant for the team, and you know, produced on a big occasion, but. Uh, yeah. He, he, he was an excellent professional as well. But, but just going back to that, the, the thing is, is Steve Lansdowne's claiming you're going to lose these star players. You know, the quality of the pit, you know, you've done so much growth. You yeah. know, the product is where it is. You're basically going to devalue it now. But ultimately, there's got to be a market for these players to go elsewhere. Now, if the top 14 in France are thinking of reducing their salary cap and salaries as well, because they've taken a hit, um, the Pro 14 as well, you know, some hemisphere rugby's never had the money to entice people from a financial no. perspective and, and clearly won't, you know, will be worse off like everyone else. Yeah. Japan, you know, seems like, you know, they, they would have taken a hit, but because obviously their company run as opposed to rugby club run and there's only sort of four or five professionals per team, mm. but that's limited in numbers, you know, and I know we've seen George Cruz go over there and I think that's probably the greatest fear, but ultimately will a lot of these players want to go there? So, you know, if a Rad Rada or a, you know, he's on a million pound a year and he's asked to take 750 grand. Is there anyone else in the world that's going to pay him 750 grand? So no. look, they, they've got to have somewhere else to go. There's, there's got to be a market or another league or competition for them to take, for them to take them because yeah, but that, in the same boat. But that's why I think France, who even if they do reduce their salary cap, that, that you're still talking about 20 odd million, you know, 25 million compared to the 30 odd million that they're spending. So, but, uh, but just, just back to the contract negotiator, just reminding me of my first ever contract. Now, bear in mind, these are the real old days. Uh, this is in 1996. So people uh, often ask me, you know, why did I go to Saracens? And believe it or not, it wasn't the money. Um, it was actually... Uh, it was so, so we were at Bristol with the first time I got um, a contract uh, put in front of me. And I was at a law firm. I was trained to be a lawyer. And I, I, I asked my boss to sort of like have a look at the contract. And he said, Kieran, you're, you're the only England player um, at Bristol. 
And so, and they said, and they said to me that, that they want me to take over Derek Eves and captain in the next year or so, whatever, which is all, all fine. And um, so they offered me a contract. Okay. And uh, my agent said, Kieran, you're, you're, you're playing for England. You should be the highest paid player at the club. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds good. So he goes into the contract, he goes in negotiation and says, I want Kieran to be the highest paid player. <clears throat> and they said, okay, yeah, he's playing for England. I think he should be. Uh, so that's fine. Um, so I was about to sign the contract. And then I got a phone call from Gareth Archer. And Gareth Archer, do you remember in the big second row from, yeah, yeah. Uh, from, from up north? Great lad. And as in those days, we did this. And obviously over the years, people do it less. But it's like, what are you on? And um, and he and I said what I was on, and he said I said well, was, I think it's like fifty five grand. He said what I said what are you on? And he goes I'm on sixty eight grand. I was like what? <laughs> so I went back to my agent, and then uh, I said to my agent, Have you heard about this? And then so so they got in touch with him, and they said oh yeah sorry yeah we should have said all right we'll give you sixty eight. Then I, I phoned another player, so what are you on? And he's on more. <laughs> So I was just like, oh, this is ridiculous. So uh, really bizarrely, on the same day, my uh, agent got a call from Nigel Ray saying, we want to meet you. And then because of that happened, I got so annoyed with them. And then they offered me the same as I. And anyway, I ended up leaving or whatever. But it's really weird um, when it comes to sort of player envy and what people are on. And I think we will talk in a bit about... um, you know, about the last dance and about real key people in the team. But we had, I had superstars in my team and I have no idea where I stood against the likes of Francois Pinar or Thomas Castagnier. But I think they were on a hell of a lot of money. Um, and, I, and we'll touch well, on... Especially we, especially for back then as well. I mean, you're talking sort of yeah. mid, mid to late 90s, aren't you? Mm. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the last dance. I mean, <laughs> first of all, I think uh, I speak for most of the population, whether you like sport or not, that's, in it, that's watched it. The best sports documentary I've seen. Uh, yeah. Brilliantly put together. I mean, I could have done another 10 episodes and you know, yeah. been bored of it. Brilliantly put together. What characters? I, I, just, I just find it absolutely incredible that all that footage they had of the, you know, the, the sort of behind the scenes footage yeah. of 97, 98 season, the final season. And they've had it for like 22 years. <laughs> yeah. like, when do you decide, right? And, I, and I've read about this. I know why. It's because Michael Jordan obviously had the final say. His production company was part in it. So right, he, okay. he did have sort of final say on how he was portrayed in it. Um, but, you know, I think he sort of, you know, let, 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 them, um, you know, let them discuss him and sort of decide to put it in just for a little bit of extra truth. But I suppose it probably could have been a bit harsher. But uh, I think he timed it just show, showing how much control he's always wanted. You saw that throughout the, um, you know, th- throughout the piece as well, how he controls a-, a lot of it. He likes to have final say and final control and everything. Yeah. You know, what a brilliant teammate though, but we'll get more onto that is I think in 2016, when LeBron James won, uh, I'm not sure, maybe his third or fourth NBA title and the old debate came up, he gave, he gave the go ahead for that footage to be released. Apparently they had that footage locked away in a drawer somewhere, I don't know whether it be ESPN or, you know, whoever yeah. be the, the Bulls owner or whatever. They had it locked away for all these years. And they're like, we just want to, you know, and Jordan just didn't want to release it. He's like, no, no, now's not the right time. He's waited like, for coronavirus, so, hasn't he? So, well, they were going to release it. They were going to release it in June um, after the NBA finals. So, you know, they're going to have the NBA and then release it then. So there's still a bit of a, you know, fever for it. But clearly the timing's been brilliant. For, for that yeah. show but I was sort of thinking you've got 22 years I mean you could have released this you know like Living With The Lions or whatever that Christmas yeah. or you yeah. could have released it maybe 10 years later what makes you think that 20, 22 years later and obviously you know it's taken a few years to get the production right and obviously to get all the old players that you played it with but, him and against him and management and everything um, and you know film that documentary but anyway look but, but brilliant, yeah, brilliant, brilliant brilliant yeah where's the I'd, I'd love to ask you and a lot of people have sort of texted me are you watching this i've only watched uh four or five shows i've still got a few to go oh, have but, you not but, seen it have you not i've, I've it? seen i've seen no i've seen oh, most, mate, I've you got three lot, boys i go well yeah so my question is is um what do you think the comparisons are in your career and 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 those sort of personalities inspirational sort of people and and whether you know at quins when you had had the success of winning 
the Premiership and how you didn't sort of continue it. Well, you know, let's talk about the comparisons of of the last dance and maybe your career in Quinns and England. Yeah, so look, you know, M- Michael Jordan, you know, he is the superstar of the show and he was a superstar of the team, wasn't he? And um, there's a brilliant, brilliant two minutes uh, finished, I think episode seven, um, where he talks about winning, at, you know, winning and leadership coming at a price and the standards yeah. you've got to set and everything. And, you know, there's a yeah. few of his old teammates say, look, you know, he was an arsehole, he was a jerk. But ultimately, years later, we know why he was doing it, because he wanted mm. us to go along that journey with it. And they've got six NBA titles now, you know, and yeah. ultimately, that's a great teammate. And sometimes at the time, you know, nowadays, he, he would be accused of bullying, you know, the way the, way the world yeah, is yeah. now. You know, pushing the standards, getting the most out of the teammate, trash-talking them all the time. He'd be accused of bullying them now in this day and age. But we won't get into that sort of debate about generations. Um, I don't. I don't think but, in rugby we were ever. I don't know whether you ever trash talked in training quite like he did, though. No, I mean, I mean look, it's brutal. it's the thing is with rugby, mate, is it's a great lever, isn't it? Because because of the physical requirements of the game, so you can trash talk what you want, but someone can really, really belt you like legally, absolutely yeah. smash you in training, and then it's suddenly yeah. like, right, actually, I've been, you know, I've been emaciated here quite a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, whereas in basketball, it's still it's still the skill, you know, it's still the vision sure. and all that sort of stuff. Sure. I know he punched one of his teammates in training, but look, ultimately it's handbags compared to the game we play. But, you know, you look at Michael Jordan, his personality, right, super skillful, super talented, you know, the clutch shots, he was the game winner and he was the main man, right? But also from a personality, he couldn't afford to be nice. You know, they said, you know, did it come at the expense of you being a nice guy? Well... If you're a nice guy, you know, classically, you know, that line, nice guys finish last, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. You need to push people. You need to be the guy to driving people to achieve beyond, you know, yeah. their own standards and their own talents. And you need to be harsh. You need to be cruel to be kind. And, you know, I suppose it's, you know, if I look back on my career, you know, who was the guy, who was the sort of superstar? Who was the guy who did it when it mattered? You played with him, I played with him, Johnny Wilkinson. Yeah. You know, when you needed to nail that last minute kick penalty or uh, drop goal or whatever it was, and someone who's so dedicated to their craft, you know, let's not forget that Michael mm. Jordan was the hardest trainer. Um, you know, he wasn't one of those that talked to talk but didn't walk to walk. Um, and, you know, I suppose from that point of view of his yeah. personality, it, it was Johnny, but Johnny certainly wasn't the guy to berate and, <clears throat> you know, demand. Yeah. You know, he demand, he wanted to demand the very best out of people, but not in a nasty yeah. way, like uh, it's been portrayed. And uh, I think, you know, I I think, probably, I think you know, pe- people are sort of drove the standards, harsh talkers. Um, you know, there's plenty of them in rugby, and they're the sort of like guys that suffer no falls. But I suppose Martin Johnson was probably one. You know, wouldn't you know if you did something stupid or that was a bit off script, that was it. You know, it, yeah, it, I think certain I th- terms would tell you. I think for me, uh, you know, I had I had some incredible people around me, uh, especially when I was at Saracens. I mean, Francois Pinot was at the end of his career, but he had this incredible way with words. And I can just imagine him in South Africa in 1995, talking to his team, World Cup final against the All Blacks. I mean, we got him at, towards the end of his career, so we probably didn't say the, see the best of him, but he had a wonderful way with words. Um, but with England, interestingly, yeah, Mark, you know, Martin Johnson, Clearly, the sort of uh, the, the, that the character. He didn't have to say much, but I think what he did was everything he did. He, he led by example, um, and he'd hit the most rucks. He was ferocious um, with the tackling and, and and everything he did. He was just great. But for and, Johnny, and, Wilkinson, and the other thing is, he was. You know, we talk about he was intimidating as well. Yes, he was you know, intimidating. If, if you were yeah. if you weren't putting your way, or you didn't do your job, or you did something against what the team wanted, yeah. the element of the team. He would be the one who would intimidate that that player the most, oh. whether it be a brooding look or just a word or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but Johnny Wilkinson, you know, you know, from the outside, looks like the sort of um, Michael Jordan character, doesn't he? You know, the, the star player in the team, you know, kicking all the points, you know, uh, you know. So, but actually, I think I think Johnny struggled a little bit with his own confidence, his self confidence within the team environment. Certainly in the early days, I mean. You know, you get on the bus and it'd be white as a sheet. He'd be still writing notes. And, he, you know, he found it all very, very hard emotionally. Um, and I think, you know, later on, you know, is actually a curse to be that driven. And I think that was a curse um, for Johnny. 
Um, but it, interestingly with Johnny, I do remember on one game, it was, a, it was a Six Nations game and I always go out early to practice passing and kicking and stuff, get myself feeling for the game. And um, I, I, at the corner, corner of my eye, I saw Johnny, he was kicking uh, for goal from literally the, the, the try line. He was trying to hit the posts, okay? So, you know, how good he is, you know, five out of ten, he'd hit the post with, you know, that much. He'd hit the post. He was that accurate. So he's practicing. And then one of them, as he went to kick the ball, the ball sort of like fell over from his tee and he stubbed the ground as well. And the, the tee went one way and the ball went the other way. And all the crowd started laughing, right? So I saw it and I laughed. and He didn't see me laughing. But as we're walking in down the tunnel, I gave him a nudge. And I, look, I, I came, I, I started out in the amateur era. So I'm, I'm sort of that sort of, mode going into professionally and I nudged him and I went oh my oh I saw you doing that that was hilarious um and he grabbed me by the throat that's what he did he grabbed me by the throat don't you ever put a negative thing in my mind just before I'm about to play I've just forgotten about that kick and you just reminded me how dare you and I was like what the fuck was that all about so he was not happy but anyway would you have done that to Johnny <laughs> Probably Mate, I remember, uh, I mean, look, uh, you know, you can try to compare to Michael Jordan and ultimately I don't think there's anyone that was had all the traits. Uh, you're sort of no. like picking players, um, you know, you, you need people that set standards and go above and beyond. But in terms of, you know, whether it be the verbal, whether it be the intimidation, whether it be, you know, the clutch moments. I think Johnny was yeah. your match winner in clutch moments and put the dedication that he would have put in. But as you say... Yeah. Dealing with the limelight, never liked it. He wasn't a forceful personality on everyone else either. I remember we played Australia um, away, 2010. We were on tour. And, you know, this was back in the day when England had an awful record on tour. And, mm. um, we lost the first test and won the second. And we won 21, 21-20, I think, by a point. And Johnny was on the bench back in those days. Floody started. Johnny was on the bench. And he used to, Johnny used to bring Johnny on for the last 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, obviously hoping we were winning the game so he could manage the game um, and kick the penalty goals, you know, in, the, in those sort of vital moments. And, you know, it worked well. Um, and I think he might have kicked one or two back then. And I think we had a penalty goal or something to go 24-20 up. And he missed it. And he was one of those that was, you know, certainly gettable for Johnny, you know, probably yeah. just inside the 15, right? Um, on the right-hand side. So a left, a left footer's favoured side. Anyway, look, he didn't get it. We carried on. We won the game, closed it out. Um, it was the last game of a long, long season. It was the last game of tour. We were written off, you know, as, as England sides usually were back then on tour. And, you know, it was the first, you know, first win away in Australia since the 03 final as well, same stadium as well. And everyone was sort of like, you know, emotionally sort of relieved, elated for a number of reasons, you know, that I've just given, you know, cracking open the beers since the end of the and season. And he wasn't what happy. What a way to finish, all that sort of stuff. The Aussie guys, Fair Play to the Change Room, the swapping shirts, you know, sharing a beer as well. You know, they were still mid-season or actually <clears throat> mainly towards the beginning of their season because they had the rugby championship after that which was the Tri-Nations. And uh, Matt Gitto came in because he played, I think he was on the bench or maybe played 12 and was the goal kicker. He might have played 10, actually. It was, no, Quay Cooper was 10. And he was the goal kicker for them. And he, go, and he asked me, he goes, oh, was Johnny about? And sort of was looking around. And uh, he wasn't by his, you know, his locker, by his pit. Don't, don't tell me he's on the pit. Nudged, I sort of nudged a couple of the boys. You know, I can't remember. Maybe it was sort of Floody or Shawsy or something. Like that. I said, hey, you know, have you seen Johnny? Is Johnny in the chassis in the physio room? You know, gets wants to sort of share a beer and swap shirts. And, um, you know, everyone's like, no, no, I haven't seen him. And then um, one of the uh, backroom staff came in. Um, he said, oh, are you looking for Johnny? He said, he's out there practicing his kicking. <laughs> and he was out there for an hour after the game, practice kicking. And I don't know, but, uh, you know, guys that knew him well, as I said, people like Floody, who blowing up Newcastle, said, look, that's what he's like. You know, he missed the kick. He, he needs to get, I don't know, 20 kicks in a row or whatever it was, 30 kicks. I mean, you know, how can you put a number on it? But uh, mm. he went out there, still dedicated to his craft, at an end of the, God knows how many games you would have played. You're not going to play now for three months. There's going to be plenty more time to practice. Yeah. You know, just let your hair down. But, uh, you know, he was so, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't know what the right word is, but he was so disappointed, I suppose, with missing yeah. that kick. 
the, to get it out of his mind and to make sure that he was at peace with himself. Mm. You know, he needed. He was so he was very off. obsessed, wasn't he, with his with his kicking and that. You know, his practice just made him separate. You know, separated him from everyone, and it's what made him great. And to oh, kick it off, mate. And yeah. look, we wouldn't be sat here now if it weren't for him, old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kicking those yeah. goals in the final. You know, in the final. But yeah. but here's, here's the thing, though. Just just looking at the relevance of the last dance and our rugby careers. Um, so I just want to ask you, well, I'll give you my opinion on, it's quite interesting what drives people, what, what separates, because when I played England schools and um, England students and played Bristol and got England A and stuff like that, and then ended up getting playing for England and then sustained playing for England for 10 years, I had highs and lows. But what, what do you think uh, for you, and I'll give you my opinion for me, so what was the, the drive? Because I saw a lot of people who I thought might have been better players than me not make it. And so a lot of kids, and when I coach them, and a lot of people say, well, what's, the, what's the common denominator, do you think, with players? What, between a player that's going to make it and that's not going to make it? And I'll tell you about myself anyway. Is, is Obviously, I never thought when I was 18, 19, I was going to play for England. It was a massive distant dream to, to play for England. Um, but I set about, I remember, um, I heard Richard Hill from Bath the scrum half practices passing every he was England number nine he did 200 passes a day so I heard about this and I thought well if I want to play for England I've got to do that so I decided I'd pass 201 times a day for the following year so I did that every single day I went to uh, Ipsos I, I went to Corfu on boys holidays and I brought my balls and I did my rugby balls and I did 200 passes, 201 passes every single day. I did my kicking. And I got so focused on that part of the skill. I, unfortunately, I forgot about everything else. But I made sure I had a, the best pass I could have. So when the time was right and I was playing at a higher level. But I think one thing I'm proud of, some people ask me, Kieran, what, what, what's the proudest part of your career? And why do you think you played for so long? Well, I, for me, you know, um, I never, ever felt that, I was doing well enough. No matter how well I played, sometimes with England, I, I get mad in a match or with my club or whatever. I never, a bit like Johnny in a way, I was very critical on my, of myself and of my game. Score two tries, but I would think about missing a tackle. Um, you know, uh, make it... No, make mate, it's, it's, the, um, you know, it's, it's the same thing that, that, that drives, you know, people have alternative ways of looking at it, but it's the constant search for improvement, for betterment. Um, you know, you strive for yeah. perfection. Um, you never get there, do you? But it is the pursuit of excellence, isn't it? And wanting to be the best you can and, and understanding. And, and I don't think a lot of players realise this, that it, is, it comes and goes very quick. Yeah. I, I was lucky. I, I Injury-wise, never had an operation. Was out of the game for six weeks maximum, two periods of my life. Amazing. Um, and retired at 37, right? And I was very, very lucky. but. I look back, I go, flipping hell, that went in the blink of an eye. And, and mm. you know, I had a long career at it. And it is, and I remember saying a number of times when I was getting into, especially when I was sort of, you know, 31, 32, 33, you get, you know, being a pre-season or it'd be the start of the season and you do a bit of media or players would come up to your opposition and go, oh, you're looking as fit as ever or, you know, you're playing. I said, the day I'm not or I'm on a slippery slope for whatever reason, mindset, injury, you know, your body can't take it anymore. You're not motivated enough. I said, that's it. I'm done. You know, so I sort of found, it, could... I found it. I mean, I found it a bit of an insult when people would say that as if, oh, you're 32, 33. Maybe you can get you a bit more experience in certain parts of your game, but you've lost the edge here or, you know, you're not quite as Nick, Nick, totally powerful, agree. not were, quite were as quick or whatever it might be. Were, were you good enough in your earlier years? That's the question. Like, I know you you played for England quite late and, and sustained. You played a lot of test matches in a, Shorter space of time. I I had injuries. I had lots of operations. I was in. I was out. Loose form. Play. But you you played for England. Sort of almost all those tests in that period. But when you were 23, 24, when you went around with the Premiership or you went around with England, look, were you good enough to play at the highest level? Oh uh, no! When I was twenty three, no. Um, right. At the time, no, no, I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have had the exposure. Um, I wouldn't have had the exposure to top players, um, top coaches. Um, uh, how, now, how did you go from being, let's say, an average 24-year-old playing for Oral to suddenly playing for Queens and England? How, well, how did you make that transition? I don't get it, in a way. Well, you, you play well, mate, and you get noticed and you get picked up and you live your dream of wanting to play at the highest level, don't you? And that, that's always a carrot. You know, I always wanted to play for England. End of story. Yeah. Um, 
you know, huge passion for the game, you know, a, more passionate about rugby than other sports and played all the sports at school. Yes. Um, you know, you had a number of obviously role models as well from when you were growing up and you, you wanted to be there, you know, when England were playing, you, you wanted, you wanted to wear that shirt. You wanted to play against the best players in the world. And that was the other thing that drove me is I always, you know, I always wanted to play against the best, always mm. to test yourself against the best. And, um, and, 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 you know, those sort of games and that need to whether you're practicing against them, but certainly playing against them to see how far you could go um, was the ultimate driver, really. And, you know, I was never going to be satisfied sort of, you know, just, just, you, play, just you, playing yeah. club rugby or, you know, playing in the sort of championship, whatever it might be. You know, I always had that ambition to test yourself. As I said to you, Kieran, you know, yeah. it comes along in a blink of an eye. Why not maximise it out and see how far you could have got? It's just a straight, you know. You know, a lot of a lot of England players they play in schools and they do really well. And they go to a club and they get a few games. They get more games, and suddenly they're playing for England. Whereas for you, it's completely different, isn't it? You know, you sort of, uh, I guess, you played England schools or, or or high level, and then you end up in a championship. You know, the question is, is potentially if you'd have been at say Quinns or whatever earlier, would you have made it earlier? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah no, I, I see. I see what you're saying, and look, you, you'll you'll never know, will you? But uh, you dealt the hands you are and uh you know i wasn't picked up you know what i wasn't in i wasn't really in you know i wasn't in their eye line um i i said to you before i didn't get injured in my pro career but at school yeah. i went to two rugby seasons at 16 to 17 so oh right so you know you're not playing for surrey or england schools or the county no. so, so you're not even in there thinking and no. back, back then especially it was very much you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It was very hard to break in if you hadn't established yourself at 15 sure. or, or whatever. If you remember back then, it was there was a lot of sure. nepotism going into school. And, I, and I'm not saying that what, why I wasn't picked at all. As I said, I was yeah. out of picks because I missed two seasons. Um, yeah. And also maturity, you know, maybe. Yeah. You know, look, rugby only went professional when I went to university. As soon as I left school, it went professional. So... Yeah. You know, you're sort of looking at other career paths. You know, where's your career going to go? And educationally, I sort of did the, you know, went school, A-levels, university degree. So, again, yeah. I wasn't sort of involved in those circles then. And I was living a, I suppose you could call it a normal sort of existence for the background I was in, really. And, uh, you know, then when push comes to shove, it was the year in South Africa that I had there when I realised when I was playing with Springboks and Super 12 players, listen, I can mix it with these guys. I actually really yeah. enjoy this. I love yeah. the training. I love the fact I'm fitter now. I'm stronger. I'm faster. You know, how much of a, how much of a better player am I going to be? How much am I, more am I going to enjoy the game because of this? Um, and, and that was the turning point, really, for me. That was a turning really? point. And sometimes, you know, whether it comes along accidentally, whether you search it out yourself, which was a little bit of mine, you know, you know, doing the sort of hard yards, if you like, and, you know, going out and finding, and, you know, not begging, but basically pleading with a coach, listen, let me join you, let me join your practice, give yeah. me a go and all that sort of stuff. Or whether your natural talent blossoms at an earlier age and you're picked yeah. up. Everyone has it's different a, journeys. It's a great story, though, because, uh, you know, never give up. You played, uh, you know, later on in your career and you had a great career, for, you know, over a shorter space of time, but you, you came came to it late. So I doubt there's going to be many following in your footsteps uh, unless they're really, really lucky. Rocket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. Welcome to Rocket this week. We will be joined by Dr. Mackie Mandela and, of course, the scrum half from Gloucester, Joe Simpson. And here's a quick teaser to what to expect. Rocket. It was basically a plea. Um, I was I was begging for some weight equipment, and it was actually a face swap. So I face swapped my <laughs> face onto Jason Statham's body. Oh, brilliant! And and oh. basically been like, can anyone can can anyone help me maintain this? Both my parents were rugby fans. My mum liked rugby very much. Uh, that's the only sport she watched. Uh, my father, I think, liked every sport. Uh, my son is a, is a ardent uh, rugby supporter and watches every game. Rocket with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. Okay, we've covered uh, we've covered Michael Jordan, and I don't. I think we'd agree that uh, there's no one person that uh, can encapsulate all of his traits and. Uh, you know, character traits that made him one of the greatest players or the greatest player basketball's ever seen because 
number of things. Rugby requires a lot more different skill sets, you know, prioritising different positions. And, uh, you know, there's 15 players as opposed to five, so it's quite hard to find one singular individual that encapsulates it all. But we'll move on to another two, you know, superstars from that era, uh, Scotty Pippin and Dennis Rodman. And, you know, just, just very quickly, you know, which sort of players that you've played with do you think resemble them the most? Scotty Pippin, you know, he's he was the, you know, great team player. Very, very talented, arguably the second best player in the NBA after Michael Jordan, but the sort of glue player that made things tick when he wasn't there. You know, they weren't winning or weren't as successful when he was there. It made a big difference to how Jordan and his teammates yeah. played. And then Dennis Rodman, who was a phenomenally <laughs> talented player, who came at the right time, the sort of defensive yeah. player they needed, but was a little bit loose. Um, a little bit loose. I think they use a quote, don't yeah. they? They say, you can't put a saddle on a Mustang. So you had to sort of let him be the free spirit and he was a bit of a loner yeah. within the group, but went out well, think, in Vegas and did, did what he did and, uh, you know, was going yeah. out with superstars like Madonna and Carmen Electra. And, well, you know, so yeah. which players do you think resemble well, Pippin and Rodman? Say, uh, well, Pippin is quite an easy one for me. Uh, I'm going to say underrated. At the time, felt very underrated. People ask me who's, who's the best player I ever played with and, Two players come to mind. One of them's Martin Johnson, but the other one uh, people think would be Johnny Wilkinson. It's not. It's Richard Hill. He's actually probably the best all well, round. Two, forward, two forwards, mate. At least you have an yeah, appreciation course. for what forwards do. Of, of course. But I said, but Richard Hill at the time always felt underrated. And and the thing about Richard Hill is when you noticed, you know, when he wasn't playing, never mind how good he was when he did play. It's when he didn't play. I think the Lions tour when he, he, he I think he hurt, he got concussed or he, he got injured or his knee or something. Anyway, you know they really missed him. And at Saracens, whenever he wasn't playing, he wasn't on the team sheet. We'd all our hearts would sink. We'd be like, we haven't got Richard Hill. And I think because he, he wasn't one of those celebrated players, he, he sort of avoided the limelight to some extent. But actually, he for me is is the is the Pippin character, the Dennis Rodman character characters is is a lot trickier uh when it comes to england uh i mean you know it doesn't jason have to be it doesn't have to be england mate it no doesn't. it doesn't no i mean look jason Leonard was a bit of a legend but in a different type of way but he was a team man he wasn't a cross dresser and go you know do all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff and go out and get you know get quite leery um it was there was a, a kid called brendan daniel uh, at Souths on the wing i don't know whether he played against him loose cannon off the pitch what a hilarious bloke he was um, I suppose Lawrence Delario had a bit of a checkered history. <laughs> he was quite loose, I think. Uh, say no more. But uh, but it's quite hard to really get a Dennis Rodman type character. What about you? Who are your yeah, well, I'd say you know, you're Scotty Pippin. Yeah, there's a lot of role players, aren't there? But you've got to have someone who's quality as well, and there or thereabouts, the best player on the pitch every week, and uh, play the same position, mate. Chris Robshaw. All um, oh, right. And when I, when I played with him. I enjoyed it a lot more than I was playing without him and the team was more successful. So that's a pretty easy one. Um, Dennis Rodman. Okay, again, he's got to be a top quality player, uh, play, but also quite loose, might miss training, go AWOL for a bit. At Quinns was a winger called Marlon Yard, uh, who, to be <laughs> yeah. fair, he, every time he played, as a, from a coach's point of view, he, he put it in when he played. Just like Dennis Rodman did, you know, sort of rocked up. He would miss training, rocked up. Everyone was pissed off with him. But then he put in a man of the match performance or close to. He did do that, but he did have a habit of missing quite a few sessions and uh, early morning meetings and physio appointments for uh, partying late on, shall we say, although he he would deny it. Um, with Eng what about England? England. Cipriani, surely. Oh, well, surely. Danny Cipriani. I mean, look, yeah. Danny Cipriani. But, but to be fair to Sips, he... You know, he didn't miss training. But in terms of cross-dressing, Sips is most likely. But you've got Andy Powell as well. Oh, right. Andy <laughs> Loose as you like. Buggy up the motorway. Um, front up. You know, tip, you know, someone like Cipriani or Andy Powell, I suppose you could say. Right. If you if they were in the press for the wrong reasons during the week, they would probably get a man of the match of the weekend. And that's probably what you're looking for for Dennis Rodman, isn't it? Because that's the sort yeah. of player he was. The brand new rugby podcast, Rocket, with Kieran Bracken and Nick Easter. Right, that's it from uh, me and Kieran for this week. Uh, another week in lockdown, but still plenty to discuss. 
And we look forward to discussing whatever might come up in the week ahead next week. Thanks very much for subscribing. Thanks very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it.